good day or good evening. Uh, this is the very special edition of the Threat Track uh, conversation where we discuss the 2021 recap and say, did are any of our predictions come true or not? And also as well, the 2022 predictions and see, you know, what we can see in that big crystal ball that we all have and 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 try to enjoy. Looking back at, you know, at, at 2021, which of course is still at the very tail end of it here. I mean, we, we had a lot of things that we saw that we thought were important or that could happen. And in particular, I know Brian Rexford, who's not able to be with us today, had made an interesting prediction about um, the uh, extortion attacks and, and a couple other things that uh, he had talked about from last episodes. So, Matt, I mean, you're, you're kind of filling in for Brian here. So any any comments you'd like to share with us? Well, I think Brian uh, hit the nail on the head. I think if I were to score his prediction, he would have gotten an A+. Plus. Um, so let's give him an A+. Plus. And I think there's a few things we can point to in the past year that sort of show that this was the trend. Uh, I think taking a look at the different number of high-profile ransomware crews doing extortion work, um, I mean, they're, they're household names, at least, for people who work in cybersecurity, RE Evil, Sodno, I mean, that's the thing. It's a household name, but I can't. I still can't say the darn name. <laughs> um, but there are a handful of them that I think you could probably throw out very quickly and say, oh, yeah, I've heard of all of these um, because they've been in the news for hitting major companies. I think what we're seeing is uh, more targeted attacks ransomware wise. I mean, the garden variety ransomware still exists, but a lot of very high profile companies um, that are, you know, have a huge impact on our daily lives have been hit. I mean, the Colonial Pipeline case is the big one in my mind. I mean, there, there are people who were hoarding gasoline as a result of this, this pipeline going down. Uh, the Kaseya hack is another one. Uh, and the DC Metro Police. I mean, these are all, you know, functional portions of our society that you never think would be uh, attacked and, and extorted in these ways. Uh, but here we are in 2020, wrapping up 2020, and this seems to be par for the course. Um, I found a slide to complement Brian's work from last year in the price of Bitcoin. And I know Bitcoin is used for more than just extortion. Um, but if you take a look at the left hand of that side, this is where Brian said was the highest he'd ever seen the price of Bitcoin. Um, take a look at the right hand of that side. You see that the last year has been absolutely crazy in terms of the value of it. So um, not saying that the two are directly related, but certainly the use of Bitcoin and the valuation of it has gone up. So. Um, it seems to be a lucrative way for people to um, do this extortion. It seems also, of course, like Brian mentioned last year, uh, that it is less traceable. Not impossible, uh, but definitely harder to trace. So cryptocurrency, I don't want to lay the blame at the foot of cryptocurrency, but I want to say it's definitely a contributing factor to how lucrative extortion is these days. I, th I think and that's a good question because I've seen a bunch of extortions and it seems like they're moving a little bit away from Bitcoin but it's always crypto. They're always asking for cryptocurrency. Mm. Are you seeing mostly Monero or some of those other? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of the, the name of it. I'm not big into into crypto myself. I think but Ethereum I don't know. is the one you're thinking of, John. Monero, yeah, there, it, it's it's interesting that they're just doing that. I, I just saw, actually saw a ransom, uh, somebody trying to sell, um, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, uh, SQL injection, and they were asking for a whole different. Not even any of these three. So it sounds like that you know these cryptos are on the the rise. People are trying to do it, you know. And and like you said, it's 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 a way to be anonymous, to pay anonymously, to to receive money and and distribute it. And you just have to, I don't know. It, it, it's it's is it a cart before the horse? Do you think? You know, is it the rise of crypto has led to more extortion, or is more extortion led to the rise of crypto? You know, that's that's not exactly clear. And I, I don't know that I really want to pin the two of them together. I mean, for whatever reason, cryptocurrency is experiencing a boom right now. Um, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. But what I can say is that the, the, the modernization of extortion is getting real interesting. And I don't want to step on, on anybody's toes when we talk about cybercrime in a second. But I had heard a story last week on Risky Business, one of my favorite podcasts about cybersecurity, where this, when he covered a story about taking a look at who has cyber security insurance in case something happens. And apparently ransomware crews are going, looking up to see who has the insurance and then directly targeting those folks because they know they can guarantee a payout through the insurance, which is a weird thing. It's, and uh, I think one of the comments on the show was that, you know, insurance works pretty well as a model 
until the thing you're insuring against is actually malicious and sentient and can pick up on the fact that this is that they're, you know, they can benefit from actually causing havoc. So maybe, maybe insurance isn't the right model for this. I don't know. It's, it really kind of caught my imagination. I don't know what you guys think about that. So, so if you think about it though, and maybe it's, it feeds into the next, you know, prediction we had made, which was about cybercrime. And this is one that you had made Stan back in, in 2020 for 2021, you know, that you had said cyber crime is that and is the new APT, you know, that's the groups, you know, they're not trying to break in, they're trying to do this crime, you know, and, and maybe that's, I mean, what do you give yourself? Let's, let's ask that Stan. <laughs> I'm always going to give myself uh, an A plus uh, for my prediction about how relentless uh, cyber crime uh, is going to be. Um, you know, some of the most advanced malware that I've ever reverse engineered or looked at has always been associated uh, with criminal gangs. Um, it's really a money-making operation for them. I think one of my predictions last year was about the scale and grandiosity of it, right? the l- relentless nature of it, which is what I meant by APT, uh, is that these attacks would just keep coming. And I think we just look at the last year, you know, thinking about these extortion campaigns, thinking about... Um, the ransomware uh, attacks that we've heard about, um, and just a testament to that. It's been bigger and bigger targets, and they've been ones that affect our lives more and more. It's not some company with some database that maybe we don't really care about or some email addresses. It's a company that delivers you know, gasoline uh, to the gas stations. It's a company that maybe is manufacturing something uh, that that's important somewhere later down the supply chain. So really high profile cases. Again, it's it's not clear is it related to Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, kind of like you guys mentioned. But it's interesting to see that there's a rise in one, there's a rise in the other. Um, and you know, to be honest, I don't think um, that prediction is ever going to be wrong. I think the scale for next year is going to be even more grandiose. Um, there's going to be more and more brazen attacks, uh, most likely. So I I think I would have to say I give myself an A plus on that prediction. Another prediction I think I made was about, you know, possibly in the next two years, um, reaching sort of like this boiling point on brute forcing and authentication attacks, authentication based attacks, and maybe having more of the industry moving to two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. And I think we've gotten there. I think there are many more sites that, you know, I've personally signed up for that support MFA or 2FA. Uh, But I think we're still not at that boiling point. I think maybe I'm actually predicting this for next year is I think next year we might be closer to reaching uh, that boiling point where the number of brute forcing attacks is just going to be so overwhelming and the criminal campaigns or cyber intrusion campaigns as a result of that are going to be so large scale that the industry is just going to say, you know what, enough is enough. We're moving uh, all our customers to 2FA or MFA um, solutions, um, all of our employees and things like that. So I have some stats around that, actually. So I went and looked up Duo's um, State of the Auth 2021 report and um it turns out that, yes, there's a significant uptick in use in the last year. I think uh, as of September 14th, they were saying 78% of users that reported to this report um, had used some form of two-factor authentication, uh, and that's up from 53% from last year. So, yeah, the needle's being moved. Um, SMS two-factor is still the most common, which I'm a little bit worried about, a little, little not, not as happy. There's better ways to do it, but it also seems to be one of the more convenient ways to set it up for people. Uh, followed by email. <laughs> yeah, user friendly is, and, and I and I absolutely hate to factor through email. That's I, I'd rather have SMS, and 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 it, maybe there's arguments, pros and cons, but I, I get a two factor through email, and I'm like, oh, that's just not good. <laughs> yeah, I just I just hate it because you have to get off of wherever you're doing to get to your email. First off, from user experience, and then I know e- even with even with trusted, you know, MX, I mean, with trusted mail gateways, it, you still have to worry about, can it be intercepted? Can it be, especially once it gets beyond the gateway? And it mm-hmm. just, it always just makes me a little uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. 
Another interesting thing about 2FA that I found from that report is that um, it seems to be driven primarily by employers. Um, this was something they found out by asking the folks if they were employed or not employed. And generally, the folks who were employed were the ones who had more experience with 2FA. My guess is because of the last two years and the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of folks have had to do work from home. And exposing work from home assets, you know, VPN or a hosted virtual desktop system like that to the Internet is a bad idea unless you're enforcing 2FA. So I think that might have been the reason we saw an uptick in the last couple of years. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree. I think that you have to wonder about that. And, and, I, and, I, and I think back to even with what Stan was saying earlier about the targets, you know, 2FA is even more important when you think about the targets that become more prevalent, the banks, the, I mean, I just saw a school here locally, a college had to get shut down because of ransomware. You know, the targets have your, your data, they have, you know, social security numbers, they have this key information. And so some kind of multi-factor is more prevalent because people are not there in person to do things, you know, and control it. So they don't know what my data is. I don't hand it to somebody. I had to email it to them. I had to text it. I had to fax it. You know, I had to get it to him somehow. Recap. And to go back, I mean, the other prediction that, and this was the one that I personally made, was about 5G. And I had said, um, I at the time, you know, I said I was real concerned that, <clears throat> swallowing a little bit and clear my throat, but just because you think about 5G, it's the move forward. It's the it's a more secure protocol. And and my concern was, what method using 5G as a method of transmission. It has all this built-in security, but that means more people are going to start looking at it, right? It's like anything else. If you say, I'm going to use it more, it's going to be secure. It's sometimes that's an incentive to research it harder. You know, we had a lot of that happening when we looked back at stage fright, you know, years ago. I mean, all of a sudden that live stage fright just got chewed up because everybody was using it and they saw that there you know, were issues. So when I looked at 5G back uh, last year, I was really kind of concerned that as a target, it was going to be something that 2021 would would certainly uh, you know go after pretty hard. But luckily, and I'll give myself a D, <laughs> I'm not the A plus. I'll give myself a D on this prediction. Maybe maybe a C. Maybe I'm just too hard because although I and, and you know and I know Matt, you've looked into this too and Stan as well. But there were a lot of things almost academically that got proposed as vulnerabilities with 5G. The actual in the wild leveraging of any of those vulnerabilities or or the impact of anything was was very low i mean if if negligible and, and so i think that at least from my observation my prediction of some kind of a 5g related vulnerability being exploited did not occur and you know knock on wood i'm very happy about that so i mean matt i mean what do you think you know what's your observation from what I've read, I agree with you. I've, I've seen articles describing potential vulnerabilities in 5G, but again, these are coming from security researchers. These are from reports in the wild of exploitation. So I think uh, you're, you're pretty much spot on. Um, it's going to be an interesting space. I think, I think partially the adoption rate is maybe part of the reason we aren't seeing quite as much malicious activity there. If the target population isn't there, then maybe it's not profitable yet to spend your time in 5G, but I'm not a criminal, so uh, that math is just speculative. I think that scoring low on our predictions is actually a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. means, you know, a viable potential threat that could have been did not come to be. Um, so I'm, I'm happy you got a, a D on this one, John. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> I also think that probably attacks in this space and you know it, because it is like a newer space and, and thinking about the adoption rate are probably more in like the five to ten year um i guess time frame uh looking out um we might hear something one day you know it'll be probably big uh or maybe not like a medium type of a thing you know i don't know uh or they'll make a big deal out of it but it'll probably be quickly addressed, whatever it is. Um, it'll probably be, you know, more of a marketing hype or it'll be something that can easily be addressed. And I think it's just right now it's either the adoption or maybe, you know, it is just not worth it for the adversaries to, 
you know, to spend their time on it, like Matt said. Um, so congratulations on getting a, a C minus <laughs> or a D plus. Well, at some point, at some point, point, you know, we're going to start talking 6G, right? It's it's coming. You, you, you know, it's coming. So maybe by the time 6G rolls around, the vulnerabilities will uh, have all been resolved. We're all happy and, <laughs> and living in candy land somewhere, right? But still, you have to wonder. The best vulnerabilities I find are always with technologies that have already been sunset. Uh, <laughs> because they have been sunset. In that case, you'll be okay because uh, maybe you'll get uh, a D on this prediction in the next few years, and uh, then we'll just move to the next technology without ever having any security issues, which is actually, for security, is probably the best thing. That's interesting because I, I contend that the, the place you find the most bugs is the stuff that hasn't been thoroughly tested. So I would mm -hmm. actually say that I, I would have expected to find uh, a little more going on in the 5G space, but thankfully, um, maybe it's just that the right folks are finding them and reporting them rather than taking advantage of them. Yeah, and that's and that's a good point too. Is is that perhaps have we entered the age of the responsible, uh, you know, uh, hacking, you know, and the responsible researcher? You know, I don't know. I it, there there's an argument there that you know fix the discovery before you announce it versus not, <laughs> but still it's it is a uh, you know a growing and, and evolving technology. So maybe we won't see as much problems in 5G as we've seen in, in LTE or 3G or 2G, you know, it's the, the attack, common attack vectors may have already been addressed. And, and the ones that are new and upcoming will get fixed before, before anybody really can resolve them or attack them, I should say. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's, let's segue, I guess, into 2022, the, the, you know, which is what, a month away. <laughs> so or a little over a month. Seems, seems forever, but so, so, I'm going to start back, I guess, with Stan, you know, and just say, Stan, you know, you, you you were talking about your extortion and your cyber. You know, I think that you have a, a theme going. So is, you want to continue that theme and share what you think is your prediction? I think we're moving. My prediction is that we're going to move a lot closer next year to actually having like a cyber war or a mm -hmm. cyber conflict in cyberspace. It might, we might not have like a cyber war or, or like a major cyber conflict like next year, but we'll definitely move a lot closer to it. And the reason I mention it is because we've seen a lot over the last year for sure um, of action, cyber action actually being taken, like operations or cyber operations you hear from Cyber Command and things like that where they've taken down a ransomware gang or they disrupted some sort of a botnet or some sort of an operation. And I think we saw precursor activity to this where like private industry was trying to do, you know, domain takedowns and sinkholing malicious uh, IP addresses. But now we're starting to see uh, a little bit more of, uh, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, you think about your local township, you, know, you have a, a police department, you call them when somebody's committed a crime you have an ambulance, you know, somebody got hurt, and you need that immediate care, you call them, something's burning, you call the fire department. Who do you call if there's like a cyber robbery or a cyber crime? You know, uh, I mean, there is, right? We have like the FBI, you can call them. But in all of these uh, places, there's also things you can do to protect yourself and, and even some things you can do maybe even like almost like offensively, like offensive defense. Um, and I think um, we're going to see a little bit more of that, especially from these uh, bigger organizations uh, that are out there, just based on previous experience, you know, uh, of, of having seen it happen and, and take, taking action against some of these ransomware gangs. I've also seen, um, you know, like ransomware gangs and, and other uh, cyber criminal actors, since they become more brazen, it might be something that. Uh, you know, different governments or different agencies are going to want to take more action to just use that action as a deterrent to mm -hmm. let them know that you cannot go unpunished for what you are doing. Because I think, you know, we were talking about why cybercrime is kind of going up. I think part of it is because cyber adversaries they don't really like it's, um, I guess if they get caught, it, it's a big deal. But if they don't get caught, there's a lot of reward there and they might feel like invincible um, uh, sometimes. Um, so I know we've seen more, you know, prosecution, more big profile names being arrested um, and action taken. But I think we've also seen that cyber 
operational action and really taking down like these uh, groups uh, at the same way they take down organizations. I think that's going to persist. That's going to keep going. I think with every like type of warfare, um, there's some point at which like the rules like wholly changed in a way that the other side didn't like predict. So uh, there's there may be a new technology or, you know, um, like think about like guerrilla uh, fight, uh, guerrilla warfare, right? Like uh, there's this army that's marching through. They have this like uh, rules of engagement, uh, but the smaller adversary, they can't uh, work that way. So they, they do skirmishes, they do attacks, they change the rules of the game. Now, uh, you know, everything changes. And I think we're starting to see that in cyberspace. There's more uh, of the cyber warfare things. And as that type of action happens more and more frequently, I think what will have to happen is people or organizations, they're going to start having to kind of be worried about this. Like they're going to have to start like thinking more offensively even uh, or thinking like, well, what if somebody takes like this more destructive offensive thing against me? Uh, what am I going to do? And this is going to, I think, kind of create this feedback loop of uh, that will probably eventually lead us into some sort of like a cyber conflict. Um, it won't happen now. It probably won't happen next year. It probably won't happen for five to ten, five years. But I think we're getting a little bit closer each year and we'll probably see more of these cyber operations take place next year. It's just my prediction, just based on seeing things that, um, you know, just from this year. I don't know what you guys think about that. Maybe it's too far fetched, uh, but uh, uh, curious what you guys think. Oh, it sounds terrifying. Um, <laughs> but I, in general, I am in favor of actions that take bad actors off the board. And I realize that there's there's very few powers that can actually achieve that sort of a thing. Typically, we're talking about law enforcement or state actors. Um, so. I mean, when you talk about cyber war, I I tend to also connect that to kinetic war, actual shooting going on as well, and that that's the part that really concerns me. I mean, yes, you can you can cause a lot of damage with just cyber power as well, but um, I hate to see something like that escalate into a shooting war because whatever powers are in, involved in it decide that war is war and all fronts are valid. So. And I agree with you, Matt, too. I think the, the challenge I have with even the term cyber war, when I think of that, I think of strike, counterstrike, you know, retaliation. I, you know, you've invaded my PC or my database or whatever, and now and that means I can now go after you. And, and I think that there's certainly in our realm, it, it, in some ways, it seems nice and be great to say, hey, you just you just broke into my system or tried to take me a denial of service. I'm going to go do it to you. But what what does that escalate? You know, how does that you know count, you know, it's like the taking down, you know, a, a a malware group, you know, an APT sounds good on paper, but does that turn into retaliation? And and that's where I get I personally get a little concerned is that you start escalating these 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 actors and and what they're willing to do, and does that lead like you said, Matt? Does that lead to something? Especially when we talk nation state, does that talk something at the national? physical kinetic level and it just it that makes me nervous i think what i would think about it is uh more like cyber conflict in the near future which will eventually like escalate into probably something more and i think it was going to be a while before maybe that transforms into something more kinetic i hope i'm wrong i hope i get a d on this one or a d minus <laughs> uh, or even an f uh, but it just seems to me that with more people engaging in this offensive behaviors, kind of, or, you know, whatever the reason might be, it's retaliation, whatever, to stop someone from doing it. But the more people engage in this activity, eventually it's going to create a misunderstanding. Misunderstanding creates conflict, a misstep. Oh, I didn't know you could do this, you couldn't do that. And I think eventually, little by little, unfortunately, um, these things sometimes get out of hand and I hope I get enough on this prediction. Um, but I'm worried that we're edging kind of closer to this type of conflict in the near future. 
you know, you've made me think a little bit more about the Colonial Pipeline hack, and I believe it was an affiliate of a ransomware group that decided to go after Colonial, not the main group. And then from what I understood, um, that affiliate got incredibly like, scolded for doing that sort of thing because that was too big. That was too much impact. That was too critical. That brought down the heat on on the major ransomware group, and they said, we, we're not playing in this realm anymore. We disavow this. Yeah, yeah, they left. <laughs> and I think that's right. I think that's as as bad as the ransomware attack was. I mean, it didn't escalate into anything crazier than that. So, yeah, you, which is good. So, so now I'm now I'm all depressed. <laughs> and we, and, sorry, so let's, guys. Yeah. So let's go. To, I mean, so Matt, what's your prediction for 2022? I mean, do we have anything? Maybe a happier news, or maybe something a little bit we can do something about. I guess is the maybe a way um, to think. Of. Maybe that, because I don't have any happy news for you. Um, okay. But, I mean, when, when we talk about predictions, I really talk about extrapolating from stuff that's already happened. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've been thinking a lot about is the major cases from the year. And the two things that really stand out to me are the, the common themes of supply chain attacks and, like, third-party third access into somebody else's network. Um, solar wins, obviously. You know, the, the, the thing about it is it's already been demonstrated on the world scale that, yeah, if you manage to get into one company that everybody else relies upon for their software and compromise it, you can go a lot of places you could never get before. Just because those other companies have, you know, world-class security uh, programs, but they're not looking at the signed software that they get from their trusted vendors. And that that's what happened to a lot of places. And I, what I understood from Solar Winds is that, yes, of all the people that got that malicious update, only a handful were the actual targets um but that's because we had you know an apt group behind it uh, i believe and they had a specific set of objectives take that same model and then apply it to someone who wants to do ransomware or destructive attacks for the fun of it um you can see that the impact is going to be even greater because then anybody's in scope um so i think we're probably going to see more like that now that it's been demonstrated just exactly how effective this can be um and between that supply chain, having to check all your software and make sure your the software you produce is what you're meant, intending to produce and the software you consume is what you intend to consume. And that's an even harder problem, I think, for most places, because, again, you're paying for it. You're not going to necessarily do a full code review of everything because, one, you haven't got the source code. And two, if you're a big company, how many different software packages do you have to rely upon to get your business done? It's it's an intractable problem. So um, that and third party access, I think it's going to be a big one in the coming years. I think a lot of folks, again, who have spent the time and money to to get to where they've gotten in cybersecurity and have something that's pretty respectable, um, still have to rely on third parties, you know, give them access to the network to take care of some sort of particular contract or because they're a contractor of yours and they, they're, their folks need time to time access, things like that. I think that's going to be is one of the things that it feels like still a lot of places don't have under control just because their ability to enforce policy, their ability to do all the things that they do for their own assets and their own employees stops at the door. Um, I think we're going to see a little more trouble in that space. A few more major cases where it wasn't like, oh, you know, we found garden variety SQL injection. It's no, we found whoever does their waste disposal or we found some software partner of theirs who has the ability to come in some through some, I don't know, I'm, I'm coming up with scenarios here. You know, movie <laughs> yeah, scenarios. Don't give me anybody any ideas. But like, <laughs> it's it's one of those things that it's, it feels like it's still completely out of your, out of control. Instead, on, when I say out of control, I don't mean it's going crazy. I mean, it's literally something that even the the most skilled defenders literally cannot control in some cases. So that's that's one of those things that keeps me up at night. What do you guys think? I, I know personally, supply chain has always worried me, and the third party certainly as well. I, I remember back to cases that I've been involved with or, or read where – you know, even the hardware you buy, you pull the cover off of it, and it's not the the insides are not the same. You you think to yourself, well, what, is it working? You know, and, and it was what what else was it doing? You know that, and I and I think that that's the type of issue that we have to be concerned about is is when do we get what we want? <laughs> I guess is maybe the thing to think about when we when we get a product, and like you said, there's too many things to check. 
and and how do you check everything you know in in, in either your supply chain or just the third party access mm-hmm. it's either you trust or you take the time to verify everything and again when that gets too big and too intractable it's just not going to happen and then you you do what you already do which is you rely upon the vendor to make sure that their code isn't full of malware and that their their code that's signed is truly their code which is what that whole model is supposed to be able to get to get you in the first place so yeah what do you think stan i think we've seen this demonstrated a lot this year you know i mean solar winds was just one of the big examples but I think uh, the bad guys are finding small ways uh, to do just this, you know, and would not necessarily even impacting large vendors. I think maybe five years ago, we saw it with maybe plugins you put into your browser, right? Like the developer retires or is not making any money. Uh, so uh, they sell for, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand dollars their app and someone else takes it over who has a, a little bit of a different motive. You know, they put surreptitious updates into plugins that are already installed uh, on a large number of devices. I think this year we saw things that were in the open source with NPM uh, uh, that were uh, patched incorrectly, things that you couldn't even easily detect because they were kind of like in this weird old dependency tree uh, buried somewhere down like a dependency path that some packages probably didn't even know they had this dependency. Uh, that was modified. So I think there's a lot of very clever clever adversaries out there who are going to be uh, scaling this up, honestly. And they have been for years. It's not like it's not a new occurrence. They've been doing it um, uh, a lot. And sometimes it doesn't even require, you know, hacking a major company. Sometimes it's as simple as hacking everyone's trust um, in something that they do every day, like a pip install or uh, a node install, right? like updating things from NPM uh, mm-hmm. repository, downloading code, uh, you know, off of a blog, you read a blog, a security blog with some POC code uh, and immediately downloading that and trying that on your in your lab. Well, you're running code you don't really even understand on your computer or, or clicking on a link. I mean, I think anyone could be subject to this and it's really, uh, it's, it's what you said, Matt, you know, you can either sometimes choose to trust uh, or you have to verify everything. And it's probably uh, not possible. And I think adversaries understand that and they've certainly tapped into that. Um, and I think that is definitely something that also keeps me up uh, is kind of thinking through that problem or uh, the implications of it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I like your turn of phrase there, hacking everything. Everyone's trust. I'm, I wrote it down because I, I really like that. I like that that turn. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to go into my prediction, which is maybe a little of a whole different realm of what we've talked to, into the to this date. One of the things that I have been looking at lately, I actually did a little research on it, was what you know we would call COVID tracing programs. You know, apps on your phone. Um, a lot of times they like to discuss these as exposure notification because COVID tracing or tracking is a little bit, seems a little bit, I know, aggressive, I think is what maybe some people thought. So I started looking into these applications that ran on the mobiles and thought, it's interesting how they work. And you look at the products that leverage things like the, the Google Apple exposure notification, the gain framework, and you look at that and you think, how does this work? And then what could be done to exploit it? You know, what What could be done to, you know, we're talking a privacy issue in a lot of ways. And I lo- started looking and th- thinking of that s- scenarios and looking at vulnerabilities that had occurred. It, and almost, I mean, not almost, like all, all but maybe a one were related to poor implementation. Poor implementation by the app developer, by the uh, OEM, somebody who had made a mistake or had taken a shortcut, right? We all know <laughs> happens a lot. And when we talk these privacy issues, we think of, I I think at least next year, the main focus on those is going to be around the near communication stuff, the NFCs, the BLEs, the Bluetooth, not not even the big Wi-Fi areas, because we're trying to talk machine, you know, phones that are talking within inches of like a a pay screen or, you know, a 
sharing a video or with somebody else or the COVID tracing. And those protocols are secure. Don't get me wrong. I've looked, a, I looked really pretty hard into BLE in particular. And, and the protocol itself is pretty secure. It's the implementation that I worry that we're going to start seeing people take more and more shortcuts as we get into those technologies, such as I take my phone, I walk into Walmart, right? And, and it starts t- giving me ads about the things that I want, right? Or I walk in to the bank and the bank says, oh, hey, John just walked into the bank. You know, what's he going to do? And, and they start telling me, hey, you know, hey, we have a new interest rate. You know, it's those advertisements, those uh, connections that can be made because I walked in to a certain place or I came in close contact to uh, a building, a bank, a car or whatever. It makes that connection say, hey, John's walking next to the car, get ready to play his favorite music selection. And those are the apps that are great from a, you know, from a user experience, but there is a certain amount of sharing that gets done and that has to be stored somewhere and that has to be processed somewhere. And I'm really concerned that we're gonna see more exposures and more risks like I said, not necessarily from a, I compromise your device, but more of, I compromise your privacy, or I stole some, you know, I, I was able to exploit something to gather personal information on you. So I, I don't know what you all think, but that's that's been in the back of my head ever since I started doing this research. I think it's scary to think about like someone, you know, taking, uh, you know, like you walking down and listening to your favorite soundtrack, maybe so you can buy the car or something like that. Um, and then having that be used for a purpose that was unintended, like through hacking or whatever. But for me, it's definitely like a scary thought. And um, I, hey, I guess everyone, please, please secure your databases. Is that yeah. is the best thing I can say? You know, to prevent compromise, because I think we do trust um, unintentionally even our data in a lot of different ways. And I think sometimes, um, especially you know now even the perception of you having done something, even if you didn't do anything, even the perception can sometimes uh, have big consequences, you know, on your life. Uh, You might've walked by something and you may not even have been paying attention, but it gets recorded somewhere. And now you're in a group of people who are being investigated a little bit closer. And there might be nothing wrong with that or, it might be something that you know throws shade your way, even though again you, you you may have had nothing to do with it. So it is a little bit of a of a scary thought. Um, I think I think to books like uh, you know 1984 and just thinking about how like people uh, were living in these like you know or- Orwellian societies and and they had no privacy, um, things like that. And you always wonder like in this book, how did that come to be? How did that happen? Um, you know, it's just taken for granted in, in the story. Uh, but I feel like as there is more data collected and as it's easier, we're actually allowing that to happen. So maybe I finally have the answer to my question of how did this happen? You know, we let it happen slowly over time. And when we don't apply security principles uh, to the data, or we don't uh, apply like security engineering just to the application itself, we might miss things accidentally, um, and it might have bigger implications than even uh, what we realize. So it's it's kind of like a scary thing to think about. Uh, I hope that uh, hacking of this or misusing of it, I hope you get an F on it, John, because <laughs> it's really really scary for me to think through that and where it could go wrong. Yeah, and some of it's unintentional because I'll give you an example of what happened with some of the COVID tracing is they, there was a situation with one app that would only communicate back to the central server if there was a positive contact. So if you're just sniffing that link, you say, somebody's positive right here. You know, so it's not even, it's, it's, just, it's just not, you know, leveraging and recognizing that an absence of data may be a, a key element as well. Yeah, I, I think a lot of developers uh, their primary objective is to get functional code working and doing the thing that they were told to get it doing. Yeah, security isn't always uh, uh, in their forefront of their mind, and the same is true for privacy. I mean, who, who as a junior developer thinks about 
traffic analysis and what kind of information it actually reveals mm -hmm. about you. Like you said, if the app only only calls out when something happened that is privacy mm -hmm. sensitive, then yeah, it, it meant something happened. There's, there's no getting around that fact. Um, you know, privacy protecting is a really interesting question, and it was so, it's something that I, I I think for years I've wanted more people to be taught cybersecurity when they're learning to develop code. I think some schools have started to add that to the curriculum in a more meaningful way. I think privacy is also one that should be brought into that field as well, um, because it's, it's either you. You mm -hmm. teach the people to write the code right in the first place, or you have to find out down the road that they didn't think about it, even though it was on the forefront of your mind, it wasn't on theirs. Yeah, un unintentional exposure. I, another example from the COVID days is that they, and a lot of apps do this, they write to public shared space on a device, whether it be a server, desktop, phone, whatever. And you don't think about that that's a, that's a shared space that might be readable or even writable by other processes on that device. And, and you think, if I can do that, could I change something? Could I extract something? Just, I may not be exposing your particular product to this vulnerability, but other things run on that same device. You have to, I, I guess the paranoia, you know, you, you can't write code or develop an app without, like you said, being paranoid about what else is, could, could happen. Yeah, and the best thing is anyone can learn to code. <laughs> Anybody can, yeah, they can. Yeah. It's a good discussion. I mean, we've looked at 2021, we've looked at 2022. Um, I think overall, other than myself, we all got A's on 2021 predictions, and I like my D. Uh, and I'm hoping, you know, for 2022, we all get maybe a D instead of the A's that we were we were talking about here. So I appreciate uh, Matt and, and Stan joining me uh, today, and uh, it's been enjoyable. And uh, next year we'll talk again. Thank you.